so maybe we can start now uh, so we don't be late and um, and uh, start on time more or less on time uh, my name is Marisa Naya I uh, from CIMAR, uh, a research center in, in Portugal. Today we are starting a series of technical webinars from the Ponderful project. So for the ones who don't know, Ponderful is uh, an European project funded by the European Commission. And we are uh, studying and investigating the roles of ponds uh, in, for, as a nature-based solution for climate mitigation, uh, deliver of ecosystem services and also protection of biodiversity. Uh, I invite all of you to, to, to check our social media and also our website to see our, our results because they are really promising. We are more or less at middle, we already um, are in the middle of the projects, so we, we have already um, some results to show you. And today is the first technical webinar. These webinars will run during this year until November. And for our first, we have Jael Palhas, uh, that is also from Portugal. He and he's studying the, um, the aquatic plants. He also uh, uh, studied, he started he, his career on ponds and the pond biodiversity. And now he specializes uh, in, um, in aquatic plants and mostly important, the, the threatened and rare plants here in Portugal. And uh, we are going to hear him uh, speaking about the role of ponds for aquatic plants conservation. So thank you, JL, for accepting the inv invitation and for being here. We are, we are really excited to hear you. Hello, thank you for the, the invitation to, to talk here about uh, my work and uh, my team's work. Uh, I will present uh, a little bit of what we are doing in Portugal to uh, save aquatic plants uh, in ponds. Uh, I'll share my presentation. Okay. I don't know if you are already seeing the. Okay. Uh, so I, I will speak a little about uh, the role of ponds for aquatic plants conservation in Portugal, and I will present uh, uh, this in three parts. Uh, talk a little bit about the biodiversity loss uh, in the world and in Portugal, the problem of connectivity, uh, and uh, in the context of uh, biological invasions and what uh, what is the role of the ponds uh, in this so uh we are losing biodiversity every day uh, and uh we are in that time where we need to decide what to do with our biodiversity to not only stop uh losing species losing habitats losing diversity uh, genetic diversity uh, within each species but also to recover uh the things we have been losing and um, nowadays we are facing uh this biodiversity crisis that is not often uh so um, talked in the media uh, as uh, climate change or economical problems but we will need to face this uh this reality uh and to solve it now it's part of the uh, of the sustainable development goals uh some goals that deal with this biodiversity uh loss and uh we now need to engage all people and uh, uh to, to solve these problems and to put all sectors in society uh aware of uh, these uh, these goals we have in portugal we have been losing species too this is a, a map of um uh plants that uh, got extinguished on uh, the most recent evaluation in Portugal. Since some years ago, uh, until some years ago, we were uh, one of the four countries in Europe that didn't have a red list of plants. Now we have it. And once we, we evaluated um, the plants and not all the plants were evaluated, only uh, a fifth of, of our um, vascular plant diversity. But um, 
we lost many uh, aquatic plants. Plants aquatic plants was one of the most threatened groups of uh, of plants in Portugal, and uh, I live in this area uh, where we lost more aquatic plants in Portugal. Uh, this is is not only the area that lost lost more aquatic plants, but also uh, the area that has and still have uh, the highest diversity of aquatic plants in Portugal. So now we have this red list. We only evaluated uh, a fifth of the species. Uh, and more than half of them are uh, um, threatened. Uh, we have lots of species that disappeared. They are now missing. Most of them are not considered extinct yet because uh, they disappeared in less decades. But, um, and we, we expect yet to find some of them. But for now, we don't know uh, where they are. So they are considered critical endangered. Uh, on the last years, we have rediscovered some of them. Uh, for people in Central Europe, you are probably looking at this list of species and thinking, oh, but these species are common in other areas of Europe. That's right, and I will uh, talk about that later. Uh, many plants are uh, still, ex still exist in Portugal, but disappear from uh, this region or for uh, uh, other regions. Some of these uh, regional um, uh, missing plants, we are now rediscovering them uh, also. So not all are bad news. Uh, and some plants are not uh, um, extinct or missing, but they are very isolated and uh, with very um, uh, few populations. So we need to, uh, to try to conserve them. But we, we might not forget that four-fifths of our uh, uh, plant diversity was not evaluated. So we have lots of species that are rare in Portugal or le uh, less known and uh, that were not evaluated. They don't uh, have any conservation uh, status, although some of them are also missing. Uh, I'm, I usually don't focus only on uh, threatened plants, but on what we call RELAP in Portuguese. That means uh, a group of rare endemic localized and threatened plants, or the ones that are already thought to be extinct, but might, they might still exist somewhere. So we need to uh, keep on mind that we might find them. Uh, we live on a very uh, special place in the planet. We are part of the Mediterranean basin that is uh, a hotspot of biodiversity. And Portugal is a very small country, but it's known for having a very high diversity uh, of many things, uh, cultural diversity, natural diversity. And uh, our country have uh, like one third of the country, uh, of the continental country, uh, is uh, has the same climate as uh, most of um, Central uh, Europe. But we also have two thirds of country more Mediterranean. Uh, and we also have a very complex uh, geological diversity. Uh, that means a very rich, and diverse um, uh, natural uh, heritage. And uh, we also have a problem of um, uh, uh, the great areas of the inland are having loss of population. So they are less studied. We have less people searching for plants. So for many areas, we don't have enough uh, effort to survey for uh, these rare things. When we consider the uh, the endemic species, we see that in in the south of uh, of the country, especially in the south of the country, we have a higher diversity of uh, endemic uh, plants, uh, and that has obviously some implications for conservation. So, so there are some species that are rare in Portugal, uh, but they are common on the rest of Europe. But this is uh, this map shows where we have plants that only occur in Portugal. So we we have a high responsibility to to save them, and when we think about the uh, the plants that are threatened or rare in Portugal, some of them are cosmopolitan species that exist uh, almost on every uh, continent. Lots of species are North Hemisphere species or Palearctic species. Some are European species, uh, and some of these very rare plants in Portugal, like Elocaris acicularis, that only exist in two ponds in Portugal or in two areas in Portugal, 
uh, exist on the rest of the world. So uh, we are losing them here, but they are not uh, lost for the world. The same for this one that uh, only is known in one uh, single place in Portugal now, but it exists in the large areas of the world. Uh, the same for this one. Uh, so many species are disappearing or, or missing, and some of them might be just uh, changing their uh, distribution due to climate change. We see that there is a pattern of lots of uh, European species that are uh, disappearing on Southern Europe, and uh, this might be uh, a consequence of climate change. I say might be because uh, we don't have yet studies to prove that, but uh, lots of these species are missing in Portugal, but they exist on the rest of, uh, of Europe. Uh, and we have a long, long list of plants uh, uh, that uh, follow the same criteria. But we also, uh, here we have some of them. But we also have Mediterranean species that uh, in, a, in a, a context of climate change, they might be very important for the rest of Europe uh, as they are uh, the plants that uh, keep the, the, the Mediterranean ecosystems working. And uh, we expect one of the scenarios or some scenarios for uh, uh, future predict that on this uh, climate change scenario, they will, uh, the Mediterranean climate will expand on Europe. So we expect the rest of Europe to get uh, drier and hotter summers. And uh, maybe it is important to, uh, to save this Mediterranean flora and help them migrate uh, following the, the, the climate change. We also have some ibero uh, plants, plants that uh, exist uh, in the Iberia Peninsula because on, uh, on past uh, times, uh, this was connected to North Africa. So some, some species uh, colonized uh, Iberia Peninsula uh, and some of them are, are very, very rare on Europe. We also have lots of Iberian endemisms and uh, Portuguese in, endemisms, not necessarily on aquatic plants, but some of them uh, are uh, uh, Portuguese endemisms uh, like Juncus volvatus, for example. Here we see some some examples of uh, Mediterranean and uh, and Iberian plants that we that are threatened in Portugal, and we are trying to save them, like Lysimachia ephemerum, uh, that is very rare on this region, uh, only one spot uh, in Coimbra, and we are uh, trying to save it. Uh, Potomogeton Schweinfurti, that is a very interesting plant that only around 10 years ago uh, was confirmed that this species uh, exists on the Mediterranean basin uh, in Europe. Uh, and all the hybrids that might exist between this species and the, the other species from the same genus uh, uh, are still being discovered. So uh, we are losing this species uh, before uh, even uh, studying them. We also have uh, some emblematic plants like the Amazonio uh, brugai. This one is really, really threatened in Portugal. Uh, as you see, this northern population we see here on the map. Uh, it, this year, we only have one individual and only two fruits. But the good news is uh, another big population was found in the, in the south uh, this week. Uh, but we have two Amazonians that are threatened globally and are missing in Portugal. We are still searching for them. Uh, we expect yet to find them, and we are making efforts uh, searching for them. But they are, these are plants adapted to uh, temporary uh, ponds and, and temporary wetlands. Um, and they are small plants, often uh, not very conspicuous. So we need more people in the field searching for them and knowing them. Uh, as we didn't have a red list until four years ago, there was no um, communication on this, helping people to know what to search for. So now we have new tools for that and we are starting now uh, this work, asking people to search for these species and expecting that some, some new discoveries can come from there. We also have some uh, other um, threatened species, they are part of the uh, Habitats Directive. Uh, and some endemic species from the Iberia Peninsula, like this one that is, is, it, is missing in Portugal, it only exists in Doniana, that is now facing a, a extreme drought. 
so uh, this species uh, might uh, disappear in the close future if we don't do something about that. Uh, and this one that I love and it exists on this region and it's one of the most beautiful uh, juncos we have um, and it's threatened too. So we have lots of uh, kinds of aquatic plants from different uh, parts of the uh, wetlands and from different kinds of water and from different climates. Um, and uh, of course, uh, nature is complex and uh, we have conscience that uh, we lack knowledge on lots of aquatic plants in Portugal. For many years, we didn't have uh, enough studies on, uh, on aquatic plants and we have few people still working on that especially for the submerged uh, plants. We also have a problem now uh, because con connectivity uh, on the past was uh, thought to be something very good for uh, biodiversity. And uh, there are lots of studies about that. Uh, but now we have uh, lots of uh, global changes and changes on European landscapes uh, and on European natural processes. So. Uh, for example, we lot uh, we have for uh, millennials uh, for lots of uh, we always had uh, herbivorous, and now for the first time in European history, we have landscapes lacking uh, big herbivorous. So uh, we have a big uh, problem of um, areas with lots of vegetation now growing, especially on wetlands. Because we don't have the wild, uh, the wild big herbivores, and also the cattle is uh, is now uh, starting to miss on the landscapes. Uh, so there are lots of plants that were depending on uh, natural wetlands and natural processes like uh, grazing, like uh, the dunes changing uh, uh, its place, and these uh, sedimentary dynamics that uh, create new ponds, that create new uh, wetlands, that renovate uh, the habitat. And now some of these species, they are missing in the wild because we are stabilizing dunes, stabilizing uh, rivers, avoiding the rivers to change the, um, uh, the, um, their course. Uh, now many of these species are missing on the natural systems uh, and we find some places where they still resist on artificial wetlands. For example, uh, sand extraction, extraction areas where we can find uh, some rare plants in, in other oligotrophic uh, ponds uh, on these extraction areas or old extraction areas. These plants uh, in the past appeared in natural systems that now are less dynamic because of uh, private property because of uh, dunar stabilization, etc. So uh, plants like Uticularia, like uh, amphibians that depend on temporary ponds, uh, now can find uh, good places to thrive uh, in some artificial wetlands that because of extraction or because of uh, different uh, activities, keep this diversity of habitats and keep these, um, these new ponds uh, to appear with uh, less competition and less um, and less connection to big river systems uh, with, for example, invasive species that we'll talk later about. So, for example, this is a sand extraction uh, site uh, in my region where we can find uh, five uh, submerged plants of, uh, of the red list that disappeared on the rest of the valley. Uh, also, the, the droughts we are facing, uh, and people always think droughts are uh, terrible for, for wildlife, but actually we have, uh, as we have lots of problems with invasive fish, uh, sometimes these, these uh, droughts and extreme droughts are important to eliminate these invasive fish for, uh, in habitats that in the past have these uh, rare plants that are missing. Uh, and after the droughts, when we have a, a very wet uh, year, we can find some of these species that depend on uh, on areas without uh, invasive fish. Uh, I also talked about the rivers that used to change the uh, their shape and create uh, complex wetlands. 
and nowadays we we have less and less uh, of space for rivers to to have these natural processes so plants that depend on these these kind of dynamics are i facing problems in Portugal too. We don't have landscapes like this in Portugal. And sometimes we find these plants not in uh, not in the river, uh, but only in some ponds near the river or in sometimes in artificial uh, wetlands near the river, uh, where because of cattle or because of uh, rice, uh, rice production, uh, we have uh, we replicate these natural uh, dynamics that used to occur uh, in the past in this ecosystem. Some plants that are threatened uh, and uh, that exist still on, uh, on our natural reserves are facing problems because uh, during uh, last decades, the, uh, the main mindset about conservation of wetlands in Portugal was to uh, not to touch the areas, uh, not to disturb the birds, because most of our uh, protected wetlands were protected because of the birds, not because of the plants. So to avoid disturb the birds, we remove all uh, activities from these wetlands. Uh, we stop controlling the, uh, the vegetation. We take out the cattle. So we have situations like these where Inside the water, we have no hydrophytes, no aquatic plants, because we have lots of invasive fish and the invasive crayfish uh, destroying all the plants. And on land, uh, we don't cut anything and we remove the cattle. So we have big halophytes, big uh, dominant plants, and we are losing all the diversity of, uh, um, of small aquatic plants and plants that depend on temporary, uh, uh, on temporary wetlands. Uh, on some areas, uh, we find these plants reduced to uh, small areas between the, uh, the, the permanent uh, flooded areas and the areas that are uh, overgrazed where these plants cannot survive or cannot produce seeds. Uh, for example, this is Butomus umbilatus, a, a, a plant, aquatic plant that is threatened in Portugal, uh, although it's common on the rest of Europe yet. Uh, but here in Portugal, we have few populations, only one population is inside um, a natural reserve. Uh, all the other populations are uh, in rice fields. And uh, as we are losing uh, cattle in the landscape and we are losing these traditional activities that were controlling the, the, the halophytes, uh, and where the, and as the rivers start to being managed like this, uh, our wetlands are not in good shape in Portugal. So some of these plants are now found in rice fields uh, or ponds that have some activity. This is my PhD work on the rice fields, finding many plants that uh, used to live on, on the natural systems and now we cannot find them uh, anymore in natural systems in the region and you find them uh, only in uh, rice production uh, land in, in uh, Quimbra. And we have a big problem with uh, invasive species. So we have more and more uh, aquatic invasive species uh, in Portugal and, and, uh, and in Europe, not only plants, but also invasive animals uh, that are destroying uh, plants and destroying the, the, um, the food chains. Uh, so more and more our uh, freshwaters look like this. Uh, and this is the main river uh, in my region. Uh, that is covered in water yacinth. Uh, now we are doing uh, great effort to, to control this. Uh, but the problem is on these big wetlands connected uh, to each other, uh, the risk of having uh, a biological invasion that uh, changes all the landscape and all these dynamics is very high. Sometimes uh, is on the small ponds that are not connected to the system that we find really populations of these rare plants. Um, if we look at the landscape and have this filter in the eyes that uh, separate what's invasive from what's native and, for what's, uh, and from what it is uh, endemic or rare, uh, this is our reality. Most people don't distinguish plants and look at the landscape uh, seeing everything green. 
and this plant blindness is a problem even uh, among conservationists because for example in portugal the focus is often the birds and not the, the plants uh, we used to we used to have uh, uh, landscapes well conserved with lots of uh, uh, with a big biodiversity uh, full of uh, rare plants and endemic plants but more and more we, we risk to create landscapes dominated by uh, the the invasive species especially when we managed it uh, not uh, thinking about the collateral uh, damages so when we have the, the landscape we actually have now it's a landscape very complex with rare plants uh, invasive plants common plants and we need to know how to uh, manage it not only to uh, control the invasive plants but to regenerate the ecosystems and uh, recover the ecosystems uh for the people that are that is not so um uh, uh familiarized with uh, the aquatic uh, the, the invasive species so we only call invasive species uh, to the species that are not from here and didn't arrive alone they arrived uh they were carried by people from other continents other regions to here um these are exotic species but not all exotic species can be invasive we only call invasives to the, the ones that are not from here. Uh, they can uh, survive alone and uh, and they can um, uh, breed alone, uh, multiplicate, produce seeds or other kind of propagules. For example, in aquatic plants, often we have plants that uh, do not produce seeds, but they, they can break and each uh, fragment can create a new plant. And that is enough to help them spread in the rivers, for example. Um, when they can colonize places far from the place where they were, were introduced, uh, uh, multiply to create great density of uh, of one single uh, species and uh, have impacts. Impacts not only on the ecosystems, but also uh, in the public health, in the uh, economy, etc. So actually, uh, invasive plants spread in the nature like uh, a cancer spreads in, in our body. Uh, and more and more we have this, not only this comparison, but also um, uh, people working on uh, oncology and studying cancer uh, are searching for uh, tools to study or recover the, the tissues based on, uh, on natural sciences uh, and, uh, and, and also the opposite. Here we see the, the invasion of Ludwigia peploides in, in my region. Uh, in one year, this uh, plant that uh, was discovered this year on the region covered great areas of, uh, of the river. And uh, worst of all, areas uh, that had uh, the biggest uh, uh, populations of some rare plants in Portugal. This is also the region that have uh, the highest diversity of invasive aquatic plants in Portugal. Not all the aquatic plants we have are already on this list. This is uh, a map from the Flora On. It's a website uh, from the Portuguese uh, Botanic Society. Um, and if we overlap all these species, we see that the place where we have more of these species uh, is exactly in, in this uh, region. The same region that in the past have the greatest diversity of aquatic plants. Some plants that were common in the region uh, some centuries ago, and uh, at least on the last century, are now missing, like this one. Uh, and for example, this species, Nymphoides peltata, it's now restricted to only one river in Portugal and is now uh, suffering an invasion from Ludwigia peploides uh, that is competing with it and covering its habitat. Uh, for many people, even uh, 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 river uh, managers and uh, uh, and uh, natural reserve managers, uh, most of the people in Portugal don't uh, um, don't recognize aquatic plants, and often we know that they they have sim most of them have similar adaptations, so they can be uh, be similar to a non-specialized uh, eye, but when we see the flowers, we see that in the same place we can have uh, very different species with 
different meanings. So this this plant that we can find uh, in this region, uh, we have some very rare plants in Portugal, some very common plants, plants in Portugal, but also uh, some invasive species that are very aggressive, uh, very common on this region and very rare on the rest of Europe. So uh, we should be stopping them and not helping them to spread. So we are now uh, doing lots of work to help people that manage this area to know how to decide and how to uh, not to help the bad ones, but to help the um, the ones that are needing help. Because our landscape is being like this and places like this one, that is, this is the last uh, plant of uh, water lily in this river, not the last place with this plant, the, the last individual of this uh, of Nufarlutia uh, in this region, uh, and some months uh, after it was covered by water jacinth, and we were trying to rediscover uh, the water lily, uh, mm. and we created a barrier around it to protect it from the water jacinth invasion. And another invasive arrived, Ludwigia peploides, and went over the the barriers, and uh, it's now killing the plant. So we need to know not only to control the invasives, but how to protect these rare plants uh, that are in the middle. For example, this riv river is the only river in Portugal that also have um, Stachys palustris, that is common on the rest of uh, Europe, but in Portugal is restricted to this uh, part of the river that is most invaded by uh, water yacinth. So, Can you say which river you're talking about? Uh, this plant, uh, Stachys palustris. It's the name of the river. I know the, the name of the river is Mondego. Oh, Mondego, okay. And, well, I will not present all the invasives, but we have lots of floating invasives, amphibious invasives, uh, submerged invasives, uh, and invasives of the banks that are uh, uh, killing our plants. Uh, some of them are not yet per, uh, forbidden in Portugal. For example, Carasula elmsi is a big problem in Central Europe. But it's not forbidden in Portuguese uh, laws, uh, and it's invading these habitats too. And some of plants that are now uh, new of on many areas of Europe are uh, for um, almost one century invading Mondego. And we are facing new invasive species that are common on the rest of uh, part of Europe, uh, like Central Europe. But they are now arriving here, and the, here we see. Ludwigia peploid is invading the biggest population of uh, Butomus umbilatus in Portugal. Here we see the two species. Well, uh, we have lots of invasions. I will stop. The, I will. Uh, but we still have some very interesting places isolated with no invasive species. And that's uh, what I want to talk about now. We have these isolated wetlands. Um, ponds, small wetlands, small springs that still have uh, very rare plants that are missing on the rest of uh, of the land, and we need to 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 understand that nowadays mm, mm, lots of species that in the past occurred in the big rivers and the big river systems and big wetlands now they are dependent on these small wetlands uh, where invasive species didn't arrive yet, where for some reason. Some uh, human activity or natural condition of, of the place can keep conditions for these um, these plants. So we have uh, a huge challenge now to identify these uh, relict populations of rare plants and to understand why they are there and how can can we uh, keep the, those conditions or replicate those, those conditions to uh, to keep them on the landscape. We also are help. Uh, asking help to people to map these uh, aquatic plants in Portugal, uh, both the natives and the invasives. And we are uh, using all uh, uh, all that we have to search for aquatic plants. We didn't have as much uh, tools that, as we have now to search for plants or to detect them. Now, anyone with a, a smartphone can take a picture and with these uh, citizen science uh, apps that have artificial intelligence and can uh, help identify plants and put them on the map and this, the researchers can 
validate the identification. So now it's easier than ever on history to, to find these plants. And we are doing that. And we are finding places like this without invasive uh, plants, with lots of native plants, with some rare plants. And uh, and this, uh, these places we find with more interesting plants are often ponds. Uh, it's very rare to find uh, areas this well conserved uh, on big wetlands connected to the rivers. Uh, but only this week, uh, the Ramsar Convention uh, 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 assumed that these small wetlands have uh, great importance on uh, on conservation. And now we have an, uh, another um, uh, tool to convince people that these small wetlands are sometimes more important uh, for conservation than the big wetlands uh, where the fight is also bigger. Sometimes small artificial water bodies that are not, well, these are not ponds, these are wells, but uh, on some regions, these small water bodies, uh, which typology change from region to region can be very important on, um, on plant conservation. And we are finding plants that uh, on past used to be on, on ponds and rivers. Now we are finding them on wells that uh, are isolated from the rest of uh, the wetlands. Uh, and uh, we are helping uh, people to search for these plants, but uh, we are uh, conscious that sometimes when we find these plants on areas very invaded, invaded with uh, invasive plants, um, are uh, sometimes difficult to conserve on those places because some species are, most species of invasive plants are not easy to eradicate. We didn't manage to eradicate any invasive species in Portugal yet. Uh, we can control them, we can uh, uh, contain, uh, 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 stop them, uh, uh, avoid them to spread to other places, uh, but in many areas, we need to assume that uh, we need to find pl safe places to conserve these species, uh, both uh, in situ and ex situ. Uh, well, uh, uh, we are mapping these these uh, uh, these plants also to find the the new invasive species, uh, trying to eradicate them uh, on time, but. Uh, until now, we we could not eradicate them. Even in places where, for example, we found uh, Ludwigia peploides in this place, uh, in the only place in Portugal with Limusella aquatica, in one of the two places in Portugal with um, with Eleocaris acicularis, uh, and it's a, a small invasion yet, but we we didn't manage yet to uh, eradicate it. So we need to think on other ways to to save these rare plants that live there. Uh, and we need to think about ex situ conservation and in situ conservation, but uh, in isolated ponds where these invasive species are less likely to uh, to spread to. So ponds can save lives, and we need to to use them for that. So uh, ponds are very interesting, not only because they have uh, there are lots of species that only exist uh, on ponds but also uh, because uh, we ha can have a big diversity of ponds on one region. Ponds are very different from, uh, from each other. We can uh, also have um, isolated ponds with very specific uh, conditions. And unlike other kinds of wetlands, it's uh, easier to make a new pond and to create ponds with specific um, conditions for uh, for threatened plants that are not finding uh, its habitat uh, anymore on uh, on existing places, so we need to focus more on these uh, small water bodies isolated from the big uh, systems, and where even when invasive species arrive, it's easier to control than on uh, big um, invasive um, on big uh, systems with invasive species. So we have uh, started some years ago this uh, uh, doing some projects about uh, plant conservation in Portugal, um, and this started with the uh, the, the project of the Red List, 
and I I started to collaborate with uh, uh, with them as a volunteer searching for aquatic plants. Before that, I was working mostly with amphibian conservation and all, uh, and I was already working on pond conservation and working on sharks convida. But um, until that time, we didn't have enough information about uh, aquatic plants in Portugal, uh, and I I started searching for them uh, and updating the, the information on those species. Uh, and I, I started finding lots of them in, in ponds or uh, uh, both natural ponds and artificial ponds. And uh, we started uh, cons conserving them ex situ too in, uh, in ornamental ponds, in pedagogical ponds, uh, because uh, these areas are very important not only to to keep um, these plants, to conserve them ex situ, but also to communicate these plants, avoiding to, to bring the, the public to very sensitive uh, places. Uh, so this is one of the ponds where I started doing this work to uh, introduce here uh, rare plants and, uh, and threatened plants. Uh, and in 2019, we've created a, a project called Charcas de Noé. Charcas de Noé, uh, the word charcas, means uh, ponds in Portugal, uh, but uh, it uh, sounds like Arcas de Noé, that means uh, Noah Ark. So we've created this project called Charcas de Noé, that means like uh, Noah Pond Ark. Uh, and it's a concept we've created to create uh, Noah Arcs for uh, aquatic pond plants. So the, the Noah Ark was created to save uh, animals for, uh, from floods, now we, we have other problems uh, than floods, drought and uh, uh, pollution and invasive species and uh, habitat destruction. So we decided to, to create um, this project to act searching for the plants, uh, doing some in situ conservation, removing invasive species from areas with uh, in form, from ponds that have isolated populations of rare plants. Um, and uh, we also uh, collected some uh, propagules and sent to the botanical gardens and to um, and created a, a nursery for these plants in the agrarian school of Coimbra. And we also uh, had a task on requalification, changing uh, uh, some uh, urban ponds and urban uh, ornamental ponds that were full of invasive species, and we we started. Uh, changing these these ponds, taking out the invasive species and colonizing them with not only native species but uh, the longer list possible of uh, rare and threatened species, uh, making them uh, accessible to the public to know them, to help people studying them, search for them, uh, and to conserve them ex situ. And we also have a, a task on on communication. This was a very small project. Uh, of a three-month project in uh, 2019, uh, but we we followed this this same uh, kind of work in uh, other small projects on the following years. And so this this project Sharkas de Noé, uh, although it was on the beginning only a small project of three months, now it uh, it became. Uh, uh, a logic of work for us uh, to keep on working with. So we made this participative service with people searching for these plants. We uh, collected the plants to the botanical gardens and science center, um, so people can see these plants on uh, on these areas. Uh, and um, when we started the project, uh, no botanical gardens in Portugal have uh, any of these plants we were working with. And now, uh, at least the Botanical Garden of Porto has now a big collection of aquatic plants. And in Quimber, uh, we we brought uh, lots of species to Quimber too. Uh, we have this nursery uh, to cultivate these rare plants, uh, uh, these aquatic plants. Uh, and as we were searching for them on the wild, and we had volunteers searching for them on the wild, we were at the same time uh, propagating them and putting on our uh, Noah Ark ponds. Uh, and also on the botanical gardens. Um, sp some species like Stachys palustis that had only 80 plants in the wild in Portugal, uh, in one year we had 400 plants in, in our nursery. Uh, 
some of these plants that uh, are very rare in Portugal, in uh, two years, three years, we had uh, almost a complete uh, collection of them on our nursery and our, on our uh, ornamental ponds. And uh, we started this task of changing the urban ponds because almost all cities in Portugal have any pond with this aspect with green uh, algae and invasive species. Uh, and uh, exotic fish and turtles. Uh, and we want to have more and more examples of uh, ponds with uh, transparent water, uh, clear water, lots of uh, native plants uh, and, uh, and threatened plants and make people see these, make people understand the role of plants on, uh, on the water quality, make people understand the role of plants on the ecosystem uh, and uh, make people want to use uh, the plants and to save the plants. Because one of the problems is uh, nowadays people see uh, rivers with lots of uh, underwater vegetation and they think that's a problem. They don't uh, see this as something natural. They see as uh, we have, uh, uh, they see these vascular underwater plants and often think they are algae and they are a problem. So we need to communicate more on that and help people understand that these plants are very important to keep the to filter the water to have provide food and habitat and shelter for many uh, animal species too and uh, uh since some years ago with the uh, project uh sharks convida where uh, uh marisa also work uh, we've created small ponds with uh, with volunteers and in in pond creation projects this is a, a small pond in a, an interpretation center uh, in the center of, of Portugal. Um, and we've created these small ponds with, uh, um, uh, with a pedagogical um, value um, where we do where develop activities, environmental education activities to see the wildlife, to see the plants, to understand all these. These are perfect uh, small life laboratories where people can uh, understand the role of each uh, species on the ecosystem and uh, it's a, uh, the best place to approach people uh, to these uh, to the wetlands. Uh, and since we started this project with uh, the, the threatened plants, we started uh, prioritizing these rare plants um, on these pedagogical ponds. Um, this is another uh, a pond in a, this is in a tourist um, uh, in a, a hostel where we've created a pond. Uh, trying to uh, keep there all the rare plants of the region and and some plants that were missing in uh, in the region but were very threatened in Portugal with very uh, with a big aesthetic, uh, aesthetic value and we introduced them there uh, and we also uh, worked with uh, uh, science centers to this was a, a, a pond in a, a science center in Portugal. Um, this center uh, is, uh, works on scientific uh, communication on forests, but have for many years these ponds, artificial pond with uh, invasive species and bad water quality. And we've created a project to the, with them to uh, redesign, not change the liner, but just change the ecosystem above the liner. And without touching the liner, clean everything. Uh, put the, uh, some uh, plants and help them to clean the water. Uh, and now we have lots of these rare plants uh, there and people can see them and, uh, and understand them. Also in the agrarian school of Coimbra, where we have our, um, uh, our team, uh, we have some uh, tanks, ornamental tanks that were empty uh, and we clean them and uh, colonize them with uh, some of these rare plants uh, and we are uh, and even test on ponds and, and tanks that have um, there were ornamental ponds with fish and invasive fish that uh, didn't have any plants and we tried to we tested to introduce some plants and to to test which uh, native plants can survive on uh, on tanks ornamental tanks with these um, invasive fish uh, and we managed to have uh, many of these uh, these plants there. Also in schools, uh, 
uh, in this school, for example, uh, we we already they already had a pond, but uh, with no um, no uh, no sediments on the bottom or no no substrate for plants, and we introduced uh, some clay, some sand, uh, and planted there some plants with the help of the the students, and now we have lots of these rare plants from the region thriving inside the school and uh, the teachers can use them to uh, for the classes. And the biggest uh, NOAA pond we've created was the uh, in Figueira da Foz in my city. We have this uh, ornamental pond in the center in the center of the city, very shallow with uh, with mud and uh, invasive fish. This is Gambusia uh, affinis, uh, carnivorous invasive fish. Um, and almost no plants, only one, in one corner. So we decided to change all these, all these um, uh, pond, uh, and we took all, uh, took out the amphibians, uh, took all the plants, uh, the stones, the liner. We re-excavated it, uh, make it a little bit uh, deeper because in Mediterranean countries like Portugal, uh, shallow ponds can have a huge. Um, um, temperature change uh, and uh, and they don't have the water quality stability we should have for for the plants so we we make them a little bit uh, bigger not bigger but just deeper uh, we've put its uh, uh, stones and and clay on it uh, and and plants and we made this uh, this place to be uh, our uh, aquatic botanical garden to have the biggest uh, collection we could have here of the rare plants in the region. So the, it was planned to have a collection. That means we need to have a, a, a huge effort to, to maintain it and to keep the collection and to control the more, more dominant species and to, to have the more sensitive species. Um, but we managed to have their, uh, them uh, in the center of the city. Uh, and accessible to everyone to know the species to uh, to to see uh, what plants can do for uh, water quality and for the rest of the wildlife and to see their aesthetic value. For example, this is Valisneri spiralis, a plant common to, on Central Europe but very rare in Portugal. That it was missing for forty years, and it was rediscovered by a student some years ago, uh, and we. Uh, in a, a water body uh, invaded by water yacinth. And we uh, collect this plant, cultivated it, introduced it here, and now uh, everybody can see it in the center of the, the city. And we also have carnivorous plants like Utricularia and some merch plants and amphibious plants, etc. We also worked on communication, uh, creating panels to help people understand uh, the value of this uh, species and, and the importance of this ecosystem approach to ornamental ponds. Um, and uh, we are all, we are also creating this uh, this illustration and these uh, these sheets with invasive plants and with native plants to help people recognize them. And we have an illustrator working for us, uh, making scientific illustration on these um, these species to put on the panels to uh, use on the activities. And we are doing uh, field activities with students with uh, with uh, the. The, the neighbors that live on this uh, on this um, on this quarter to help them understand the value that they, they have there, um, and now we have uh, we are create, trying to create a network of of places uh, in many cities that can have these uh, these ponds with the same logic. Uh, this is ex situ conservation, but we can also try to do something like that in places where we have. Uh, uh, where we have uh, ponds in situ uh, that we can help colonize with with uh, the rare plants, so they can have in situ populations uh, far from the invasive species and that are less likely to be affected by the uh, these big problems that are affecting the big wetlands. Even on cities, even on the center center of cities, we can have ponds with uh, high biodiversity, with high uh, ecological value. And we have been working with municipalities too uh, for some specific plants. And each year we try to have uh, small projects on different plants to, to help new plants each year uh, complete the collection 
on these ponds, complete the collection on the botanical gardens, and complete the, the surveys on the field and the in situ conservation too. And we are uh, uh, putting these panels in places like this. This is uh, in situ conservation in a pond uh, in the uh, a natural wetland that was uh, transformed in a park uh, some years ago. And uh, in in a, a small valley that a small valley that is not yet invaded uh, by many of these invasive species, and we are translocating translocating here many of these plants that are disappearing from the central part of the valley, but they can find here a new habitat more isolated from the uh, uh, from the river, but where where, where they can thrive in, from where we can um uh propagate the species to other places also the work keeps on uh schools and in the cities to search for new places that are with invasive species and changing them uh, for uh rare species uh this was a school and this uh was on the last month with uh on one of these visits uh the visit we i show you on the the other photos with the kids uh, near the pond, uh, the teachers were talking to me that they have a tank on the school uh, with some species that they think they were invasive. And I went there and it was Salvinia molesta, an invasive species. And on that week, we went there and took all the invasive species and cleaned the pond, uh, or the tank in this case, and, and uh, colonized the pond with uh, the rarest plants from the region so they can have now that in, in the school. And that's it. We have been working this with uh, uh, this team from different uh, institutions, uh, and uh, with this. Uh, and each year we have these small projects with different with different institutions that are funding this continuous work on uh, saving aquatic plants and using ponds for that. Thank you so much, Jael. It was really, really interesting uh, knowing about all these all these plants that are threatened in Portugal and also how how we what we can do because not only researchers but also as you said, citizen science, everyone can can contribute to that. So we have some questions on the chat uh, and and comments. Uh, Jeremy, you did some comments on the chat. Do you want to do you want to speak or should I read it? No, nothing special. Just to just to say, it would be really great for Ramsar, I think, as examples to be taking to Ramsar to start campaigning to get sites identified as Ramsar sites. It's a really, really good example. Um, and I just sent you a, few, a couple of pictures of a place where we have done one of these ponds for a rare wetland plant for for Elisma, Amazonian Elisma, which I just happened to be visiting last week. Just that was just your oh. interest. <laughs> well. Yes, uh, uh, for example, the population we found with the Amazonium, and we have not proved yet that it's uh, only the Amazonium burgai. Maybe we have also the Amazonium alisma or polyspermum. We want to verify it uh, this week. It was discovered in a place where they have a big project to create a supermarket. Mm -hmm. uh, and people were, were lobbying about the birds and the turtles and everything. But actually, when we started searching about the plants, we found that the value of the plants there is much bigger than the value uh, uh, of the other groups because they cannot sp spread that much. Uh, and uh, the, com the plant community we have there, it's really, really rare in Portugal. And uh, for example, the Amazonia, we have only have now two places with it in Portugal. One plant in the center of Portugal this year. Of course, we, we still have a seed bank, we expect. So maybe next year will be a be better year. But uh, in the south, we only have uh, a couple of pools, uh, rock pools with the Amazonium. And uh, on this wetland where they want to create a supermarket, uh, they found miles of them, the, uh, thousands of them uh, this week. So maybe, maybe, uh, and I, I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about that because I, I've been searching for the Amazonium for the last uh, years and finding a big population like that uh, is amazing. And maybe you can have uh, more than one species there, but it's not it's not uncommon that they share the habitat. So uh, the problem of this is uh, 
we don't have uh, legal support on uh, protecting ponds uh, unless we have uh, uh, these plants on the habitat the directive mm. habitat. That's just the same for us. That's just the same for us. And for example, all the these European plants that are uh, disappearing from Portugal, uh, they are common plants on Europe. Mm. So they are mm. they are not on the directives. They are no, they are true. rare for us. So we should have uh, national laws protecting them, and not only we, we should not be depending only on uh, the habitats directive. And uh, also, we have some endemic species that were uh, discovered uh, on the recent years, and they are still not on the directive. So uh, we need new tools to protect these areas, to make uh, the society recognize the value of, of these isolated ponds with relict populations. Yeah, great talk, by the way. Thank you. You're welcome. You also have a question for uh, Anna. Uh, are wildfires having a ripple effect on the decline of aquatic plants? Uh, a cascade effect. Well, uh, we should have more people working uh, on aquatic plants in Portugal. So I, 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 uh, I'm afraid we don't have enough data on that. Uh, we, what we are seeing, uh, actually, these questions is uh, is are complex. For example, uh, the the fires can, for example, uh, clear areas where the that were uh, um, overgrown uh, because we have no uh, grazing animals. So, in some cases, uh, fires might help some uh, aquatic plants. And for example. Uh, we have a big fire in 2017. Uh, it was uh, like a hurricane with fire, a dry hurricane with fire. Um, and half of the central Portugal burned that year, that day. Um, and we have uh, big, big ponds that all the aquatic plants burned. Uh, we have Potomogeton uh, and, and Nymphaea uh, burning in a wildfire. Uh, uh, and that that have, have many consequences. Uh, they, we saw on the following years uh, an increase of of nutrients, so an increase on vegetation growth, uh, but also uh, many wetlands that were covered by um, by uh, invasive species or by forest uh, were uh, rediscovered. And we had some uh, to have two two three years to search for the plants on these wetlands. It was not enough. We had not enough people to search for that. And now the vegetation uh, grew again and some of these wetlands are overgrown again. Uh, but some plants might have reappeared for that. For example, uh, Caropsis verticillata inundata, that it's uh, almost endemic to to this, uh, to this the peninsula. We, we found, refound that in the region uh, after these fires. Um, we also have another problem because when we have fires and when we when we have fires killing people like we had in Portugal last years, uh, the the local authorities start to uh, doing some taking some measurements to to show that they are taking care of the problem. And sometimes what they do is to take uh, temporary ponds and excavate them to make them permanent for uh, water collection to combat the fires. And this have a huge impact on negative impact on the uh, these ponds because, well, the temporary ponds are very specific and they have lots of species that depend on on them to be temporary. And when we excavate them, we not only change the habitat but we remove the the seeds and the the eggs of the animals and everything from these sediments. And on temporary ponds, often the sediments are the most valuable part of the pond. It's the part that keeps all the uh, all these propagules and the resistant forms of uh, of the fauna. So we have all this happening at the same time, and a few people focusing on uh, aquatic plant conservation, uh, even in 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 well natural reserves and protected areas. The focus is still. Uh, more the birds than the aquatic plants. So sometimes the management against the fire or to conserve the birds 
is killing or or not helping uh, the aquatic plants. And I would also like, to, I have a land in Serra de Estela and I just discovered like a big lagoon actually, like 40 nice. meters wide. Uh, I didn't know it was there. <laughs> and um, I wonder if like you send out packages with these endangered species and that private people can just plant them in whatever water body they have around where they live or how I, I usually can... only only send plants for uh, schools and artificial ponds in natural lagoons and ponds the priority is to see what we have there so okay. uh, don't plant anything uh, from other places before mapping everything you have there and be, before observing the, the the place along the year and along the years, so maybe you you have you can have big surprises when you start identifying what, what you have on your uh, pond. Uh, often people have a pond and think they don't have anything valuable there, and then we arrive there and we see uh, really rare plants. So the most urgent thing to do is to study what we have, and we are helping people to identify. Uh, everything. So if you have a smartphone, take pictures of everything, uh, put on iNaturalist and I help you identify uh, everything. And uh, if you don't have, uh, if you find you don't have anything interesting or if you have uh, problems like invasive species, uh, we can uh, give you some advice how to control invasive species. And before introducing something from other places, uh, you can, for, for example, try to map what you have on the nearby ponds and nearby lagoons and uh, start replicating this methodology uh, on your area, uh, especially uh, in the few kilometers around, because uh, we need to be really carefully uh, uh, changing things from one side to the other, because you can accidentally introduce, for example, uh, invasive uh, snails or invasive uh, animals or algae and everything. So the best we can do is not to introduce things, but to search what we have around. And maybe you'll discover uh, really interesting things on your region on your or on your land. Yeah. OK, cool. Thank you. Does anyone have uh, any more questions? So I think we can finish. Uh, thank you again, Jael. I'm just going to, um, to leave uh, in the chat a link for our most recent uh, animation video that we produce in, in Ponderful, because I guess if you are here, uh, you, you like ponds and you are interested about, uh, about ponds. Uh, and this is a, a very good, uh, a very good uh, video about their importance, their threats, and what we can do to to protect them, and the work we are doing in Ponderful as well. So once again, thank you, Jael, for accepting, and thank you all for for being here uh, and having have a. Oh, I think we are we have a a person, Lena. Do you want to say something? Uh, I was just applauding for the great talk. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you all. Thank you for coming and have a great day. And you can contact us by uh, the project Charcas de Noé. I put the, uh, the Facebook link there. Uh, the website is now not working. We are changing that. But in a few months, we think we'll have another uh, website online. Uh, and you have any doubts about this and about uh, plant conservation in Portugal, you can contact our team or contact, for example, the, the Portuguese Society, uh, Sociedade Portuguesa de Botânica, the Botanical Portuguese Society, uh, that uh, also helps a lot on this. Uh, there's a question here. How long is the project going on for? So uh, the project Sharkas de Noé started uh, in, uh, in 2019. Uh, of course, this is not our main project. I, I'm uh, inside the a team that is working with invasive species and uh, doing lots of research and, and public uh, dissemination about uh, invasive species. And 
these projects, Sharkas Noé, it's like a, a, a side project uh, that we keep uh, on working. Um, but officially, the project already ended. Uh, but we we keep on working on the same um, uh, work line uh, every year. So there are any more questions? So thank you, everybody. Have a great day, and thank you for coming. Bye. Thank you.